Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from in the world today. Uh, my name is Erin, and I am the content manager at Bright Talk for the BI and analytics community. And today you're tuning in to the Bright Talk live panel discussion, Insights in the Cloud, Guiding Your Cloud Analytics and BI Strategy. Very excited to start the conversation today. So just a little bit of background on my role before we kick off the discussion. I am a content manager here at Bright Talk, and I manage the BI and analytics and big data management communities. I specialize in creating and curating content around the topics of machine learning, AI, advanced analytics, data visualization, big data, and BI tools. And I also do this globally by collaborating with experts all over the world to create content that will help keep our audiences informed and engaged on what's happening in the industry. So if you have any questions about how you or someone you know can get involved in our BI community on Bright Talk, then you can email me at egenio at brighttalk.com, or you can contact me via the Twitter handle below. So I'm here today with a few great panelists, uh, including Isabel Nuage, Director of Product Marketing at Talend. Welcome, Isabel. Thank you very much, Sherry. Thank you. And we also have with us today Brajesh Goyal. He is the VP of Engineering at Kavir and Systems. Welcome, Brajesh. Thank you, Erin. Happy to be here. <laughs> and we're also lucky to have with us here today Vincent Lamb. He is the Head of Cloud Product Marketing also at Talend. Uh, welcome to the conversation today, Vincent. Thank you. Great to be here. Great. So I guess if we could just do a quick round of introductions for the audience, uh, that way they can kind of get a feel for each of your backgrounds and your areas of expertise. Um, I think that would be really helpful for the conversation. So uh, Isabel, would you like to kick us off with some background on yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm Isabel Nawaz. I'm the Director of Product Marketing and Talent, uh, focusing mostly on big data. And um, I've got um, you know more or less 20 years of uh, experience in the um, uh, data and analytics space. Uh, I held several positions at business objects and SAP in the past, focusing on analytics on uh, big data. Excellent. Um, thank you. Uh, Brijesh, would you like to do uh, an introduction? Absolutely. Uh, my name is uh, Brijesh Goyal, also go by BG. I currently lead engineering at Kavrin. Uh, Kavrin is a cloud uh, security uh, uh, startup. Prior to that, I had uh, sold, I had built a hybrid cloud management company called ITAP, uh, which I sold to ServiceNow. Uh, I started my career at Oracle as a developer about 20 plus years ago. Started talking about, you know, cloud, before it was called cloud, uh, grid computing, uh, back at Oracle in 2002, wrote two books on the topic. So I've been very active in variety of product management, technical marketing, business development, now engineering roles in the cloud space for a very long time. Great. Um, and Vincent, if you'd just like to tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Vincent Lamb here from Talend. Uh, just a quick little something. So currently, I head up uh, cloud product marketing. And so uh, the term cloud in my title is very specific because um, you know, as a company, Talent is a cloud-first company, and it's something that, that we've just seen as uh, being kind of uh, pretty transformative. So I, I think I'm really happy to uh, be part of this conversation today that's centered on, you know, uh, how cloud plays a role. In terms of my background, uh, I've done corporate marketing, product marketing, product management, development, uh, kind of you name it. So pretty much a mixed bag, but I, I think common to all that is um, I do have um, analytics in my background and certainly um, security and integration as well. So this is going to be a great talk with this crew. Absolutely. Yep. We've got some, some, really, um, some really great experts here. So um, now that everyone has been introduced, I just want to remind the audience that this is indeed a live panel and we want to keep it as interactive as possible. So. Uh, this is the perfect opportunity to submit any questions that you have during the presentation uh, using the, the questions box on your screen, and we'll try to get those answered for you by the panelists toward the end of the discussion. And as always, don't forget to rate the webinar and provide any comments at the end if you can, because we definitely appreciate the feedback. And so with that, uh, why don't we kick off the discussion with a bit of an introductory question to set the stage for today's panel. 
And Vincent, I believe it was you who originally posed this question during an earlier brainstorming session, so maybe you can start us off with your perspective on this. But uh, why is cloud significant to BI and analytics, and does it change BI and analytics strategy when we use the word cloud to describe it? Yeah, uh, happy to, to tackle that one. So uh, I, I think, you know, obviously central to today's conversation is, is cloud, BI, and analytics. And so that term cloud, does it really mean anything, you know, significant? Is it just kind of a, a small descriptor that you put in front of something because it's 2018? Or is it actually something that's much more meaningful, meaning um, it, it's more than a descriptor. It, it's, it's about how, you know, it's fundamentally changing how we do business around these, these two topics. And so, you know, I think obviously I'll, I'll, I'd love to hear from the rest of the panelists here, but I, I can tell you my take is that cloud is absolutely significant. Um, I, I think we can see cloud impacting um, all areas that, that um, companies touch and, 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 and deal business with, uh, everything from infrastructure to, um, you know, platforms like AWS, Azure, and Google that are really um, changing the way businesses work and all the way down to the applications themselves. So, you know, when we talk about BI and analytics, um, the fundamental shift there, I think, is really significant in the sense that if we look at just kind of wholesale what the term cloud really means, and then we overlay it on top of the value propositions of BI and analytics, we get something pretty pretty interesting. So um, I'll just say a, a couple of things. One, I think cloud is, 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 is a game changer, and it's a game changer for a lot of reasons. I think it's a game changer from an agility perspective. Uh, being able to kind of get software when you want it, where you want it. Um, it's no longer the old world of having to procure it through a download or have to install it on anything. I mean, it's just set up and go. And part of that really fosters a sense of agility. I think we've seen in the market a lot of companies, because of that, are willing to try things, are willing to adopt and try out new things, uh, play with their data, try out new tools on the data to see what it looks like. Um, and this is all possible because of that that aspect of cloud. And then I think the last thing I'll, I'll touch on briefly before um, I turn it over to the rest of the panel here is, um, you know, it's a game changer also in terms of um, scalability and use. So it, it's no longer there, – there, there are no more – if you tend to take the cloud proposition and back off a little and think of it as the real value of cloud today and BI analytics and beyond is the fact that you can start – doing what you care about without worrying about the things you don't, right? I mean, that's the way I really think about it. So what, what things don't I care about as a data analyst? I don't care about setting up software. I don't care about scaling. I don't care about needing to add another core, another server, upgrade my box. I don't care about upgrade at all. I'd love for that to be taken care of for me. I'd like to just focus on slicing and dicing the data, applying my model, uh, analyzing the data in depth, getting some rich value out of it, that's what I care about. And what the cloud proposition fundamentally is, is it allows me to focus on those things without touching those things that don't matter. Great. Yeah, great introduction. Um, I definitely agree with um, the statement that it's a game changer. Um, Isabel, uh, Brajesh, do either of you have anything to add? So I agree with Vincent. Go ahead, Brajesh. Go ahead, Isabel. Go ahead, Isabel. Um, so I totally agree with the agility um, uh, you know, uh, benefit from the cloud because we've seen customers being able to shrink down you know, um, years of uh, you know, implementation deployment and getting time to value down to a few months. We just had our um, Talent Connect event uh, in Europe and we had a, a customer in the energy space who was able to um, get return on the invest in, investment in a matter of six months. And they're at eight months of their deployment. They were able to do it with the cloud. And they're already able to show uh, vast business use cases ranging from you know, uh, improving business processes up to you know, predictive maintenance for their different plants and uh, gas turbines. So it's very impressive how the cloud can actually shrink down the time to value for a lot of the companies out there. You know, I, I absolutely agree. I think even if I go back uh, two decades and before cloud was called cloud, uh, we all we always felt, and it turned out to be true, uh, the BI and analytics have been the sweet spot or the early movers to gain benefit from the agility and the speed of the cloud. And two, two, I mean, the few use cases. If you look at the, all the analytics use cases in the financial industry, you know, bioinformatics, security space. It's, it's 
old old days it used to take long time to set up uh, the environment to run your analytics on the cloud you get it right away you know the agility and the speed and the scale that you could get for your analytics work is amazing with the cloud there have been a lot of en- en- enhancements or en- advancements in the bi analytics it's not just the big old data warehouses you have a lot of unstructured data a lot of the new analytics technologies uh, and you don't need to worry about as uh, Wilson talked about setting it up you want it you get it and you get it at the scale that you want and you tear it down you don't need to have these boxes built in your environment and and run and spend millions of dollars in house in your own data centers you just get it and you get your things done and off you go don't need to worry about operational management don't need to worry about scale you get don't need to worry about any of those headaches and you get the work done and get the analysis that you want done and 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 keep going great yeah absolutely so given that um you know the cloud is becoming such an established uh part of bi and analytics um at this point in time maybe we can kind of turn the discussion towards um ways in which uh, people can future-proof their cloud design and some cloud use cases that would be helpful today and then maybe touch on some for tomorrow as well. So maybe I can get started. So uh, we know for a fact that, for example, in our domain, you know, when uh, customers are actually uh, moving their data from other data sources to the cloud, we know that the majority, you know, 90% in fact, of them are actually hand coding. So there's a danger in hand coding because people might think that you know it's cheaper, easier uh, for starters, but hand coding is really hard coding because whenever you need to make a change, whenever you need to port to another platform, you have to you have to rewrite everything and reinvent the wheel. So when you're thinking about a, a cloud design or cloud architecture, you need to think about um, a, an open architecture, something that will help you uh, become much more agile, be able to make changes, reuse what you've done, and be able to port it very quickly. And so today, a lot of the companies who are moving um, to cloud analytics, they just simply do a copy-paste from the Teradata to the cloud. But this is not really enabling the new use cases. They simply are porting the existing use cases to the cloud. So they really have to think through how they can um, become much more agile and cater to the new business use cases that might happen in the future. Yeah, I think I'll touch on your um, question, Aaron, about future-proofing. So, um, you know, I, I think we've extolled a lot of the differences in the cloud, and for sure, uh, everything that we said is, is spot on. I agree completely with my fellow panelists here. I, I think at the same time, you know, because of, of, of the way that the industry is architected with different products and different vendors and that sort of thing, some 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 of the, the old type of... Um, problems creep their heads, right? And so even in the cloud, even though as new as it is, um, you know, there are still sometimes um, issues with interoperability, you know, or, you know, shifts in terms of, you know, moving from one vendor to another. And so when you talk about the, the future-proofing aspect of it, um, I think there's certainly an element of that that has to be considered. I think if you um, kind of look at how you're pulling in data for your analytics from a variety of different sources, and let's say you're feeding a cloud data warehouse of some sort, um, you know, I, I would just recommend to the audience here, holistically look at all the different sources you're pulling from. Uh, make sure that, you know, you've got that flexibility to be able to adapt quickly, you know, because that, that is kind of the name of the game. You can, on a, you know, flick of a switch, a couple clicks of the mouse, um, you know, start another environment very quickly. And so uh, being able to flexibly uh, take advantage of that without impacting yourself is pretty important. And, and you know, obviously... I would say I'm a little biased. I, you know, I work for an integration vendor, and that's kind of what we focus on. And so, um, you know, from that perspective, I'd say, you know, we've seen it done. Uh, and, and, and there's a difference between insulating yourself from change and versus taking advantage of change with something that will protect you from it. So that's just kind of more of a general best practice. Um, you know, but, but the one thing I will point out is that in a lot of ways, um, Cloud is just, it's pretty amazing in terms of how the whole ecosystem has shifted. And so, you know, we're talking about analytics platforms moving to the cloud, but, you know, all the data sources are moving to the cloud. You know, um, these streaming sources, these Internet of Things that, that you know, really um, funnel through the public web in many cases, you know, to some sort of um, 
collection. And then also, you know, if you look at um, a lot of the data warehousing platforms, they're moving to the cloud as well. So um, that's a pretty interesting paradigm shift there as well. Yeah, and I think uh, both, uh, you know, uh, Vincent, you and Isabel touched on some very interesting uh, uh, topics here, the data modeling and future proofing. The way I think is, I don't think, you know, cloud is an awesome enabler. It provides us with a lot of amazing tools and technologies to get our work done faster and a lot more efficiently at a much lower cost, but does not take you away from your sense of the past. In the past, also, you if you do if you don't architect and design and model, you pay the price later on. Uh, you, so any any project you take on, you got to think it through. Good thing is with the technologies available today, you can keep the data and and do a lot of interesting things with different kinds of data sources. You, if you want, keep the data in files. If you want, keep the structured data, keep the data in the database, SQL databases, no SQL databases. The good thing is you could keep, as you start with the data, look at the data, keep it in the form which is the most efficient form for that data, and then use cloud and, and, and a whole variety of tools and technologies available in the cloud to integrate and to solve the problems you need to solve. But it is important before you take on any project in any aspect is you put decent amount of thought process into modeling and designing the environment and then and then putting together your BI analytic solution. Uh, it's, and in terms of future proofing, I think which is good thing is uh, certain uh, technologies, you know, SQL, NoSQL, you know, uh, the, the uh, Hadoop and all those environments, all those technologies available from a variety of providers. Uh, and it, it doesn't fully eliminate the interoperability problem. You know, Vincent touched about some of the data, the gravity, data location things as well, which uh, we'll probably will dig into more. It's, but but it, it reduces the headache. If you design things properly, it doesn't fully really eliminate the interoperability problems, but you can uh, you can be in a much better shape in terms of moving efficiently with the project uh, with your project, deriving value from your project, and making tweaks and changes and evolving what you did uh, as you as you in your journey for that for that uh, analysis or for that project. Great. And I'd like to add on top of Vincent when he was talking about the multitude of data sources that we, we, we are also seeing you know, companies who are recreating data silos in the cloud. And this is kind of dangerous because we're with all the explosion of SaaS applications that the line of business, you know, those shadow IT, buying their own apps in the cloud. And this makes these new silos make you know, some crucial analytics such as you know, customer 360 view or even your employee 360 view extremely challenging because data is scattered everywhere. You don't even know where your customer data is located, whether that's on-premise, in the cloud, or a combination of both, which application has them. So um, one of the tendency is uh, avoid, um, I think one of the best practices I would say is to avoid creating new data silos in the cloud. Great, yeah. Um, thank you, Isabel. Um, so uh, we touched a little bit, or uh, Brajesh and Vincent touched a little bit on data modeling and kind of chatted about um, why it's important. Um, but I also, I wanted to touch on data quality as well. Um, I mean, obviously data quality is crucial to analytics, but um, you know, it would be great if we could just get a little bit of uh, your perspectives on just exactly why it's so critical and um, talk about can it be provided by one app at a time or should it be part of the platform? And then maybe a little bit about what can happen if you actually ignore data quality. Yeah, sure, I I'll, can take that. Go ahead, Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Um, yeah, I, l listen, data quality is an issue regardless of, you know, your on-premises in the cloud or, or anywhere else. I mean, it's, it's fundamental to the actual output and the experience you get with BI and analytics. You have bad data. It doesn't matter what tool you're using. It's not going to give you the results that you want. And so I think uh, from that perspective, 
it's, it's a fundamental table stakes thing that you just have to get right. And, I mean, do you do it on, on at the source? Sure, if you can, that'd be great. I mean, the less errors and the less bad data you can get flowing into the, your pipes, the better off you will be. Uh, but I would say that in consideration of the discussion we had earlier about being flexible, in consideration of, um, you know, being future-proofed, uh, you kind of want to consolidate your data quality, to be honest, because, look, there's no guarantee that every single source you have is going to have clean data. And, you know, I once talked to somebody, and this was years ago, uh, she told me that data quality was not an issue for her, and, I, and this is, you know, uh, yeah, and, and she, she ran a tight ship, apparently. And I, and I joked with her, and I was like, all right, so, so it's great. I mean, you're, you're like an edge case. You know, you're, you're like one of the few that claim that they don't have any data quality issues. But let me ask you a question. Do you interact with other people? I mean, do you interact with other businesses, other companies, you know, customers? And she says, yes. And I go, do you think they're all as meticulous as you are, that their data is that perfect? And she says, no. Well, I go, then, then you pretty much have a data quality problem. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, it's a problem no matter where, you know, what we're dealing with. But, but the point is this. In the cloud, uh, you're going to have the flexibility to scale. You're going to have the flexibility to pull in, you know, data from SaaS applications from, from, you know, B2B, from IoT, whatever, you name it. Um, and, and if you can make sure that the cleansing step is done consistently at a certain point in your integration before you feed it to, you know, let's say your data warehouse for analytics, uh, then you're going to be in a better spot than you would have been if you didn't. And so doing it in one spot also allows you to consolidate your rules so you don't have to do it multiple times. It kind of gives you insights. You know everything going in and everything coming out. And, you know, if you start really kind of pulling the onion back, you know, you can start doing things like, you know, master data management and other things on top of that for single versions of the truth, but probably getting ahead of myself here. But the point is, do it in one spot while you're integrating the data from various cloud sources, and you'll, you'll be better off. So just to give you some stats, um, we do have uh, some stats that show that, you know, um, maybe half of the data in most companies has uh, data, uh, integrity, uh, data integrity issues. So imagine that half of the data you're dealing with to make your decision is of poor quality. So it's the garbage in, garbage out effect. And um, I think Ghana is estimating that the poor data quality is actually impacting a lot of the companies, and they actually quantified it to 50 million uh, per company. And uh, so data quality should not be uh, you know, considered in isolation in its own silo, as uh, Vincent mentioned. And but it should be pervasive you know, across the board. So almost like a virus checker to ensure that from the source to the use uh, within your analytics and decision making process that you have proper data quality going across. So historically, um, you had IT you know, dealing with data quality. They were the ones fixing uh, the quality of the data with the zip code standards, et cetera. But nowadays, uh, we are seeing companies uh, allowing the line of business people helping curate the data. So there's a need for the line of business people you know, being responsible, being the owner of the data, of the quality of the data. And they can also collaborate with IT to ensure not only proper data quality, but also proper data governance. Great. Um, Brajesh, do you have anything to add? No, I think the, uh, both Isabel and Vincent have shared some great insights. Uh, that's, that's great. I think it's, it, it is as it's, it's, a, it's a problem. It needs to be addressed and it needs to be thought through. Uh, so it makes sense. Perfect. So um, moving on to data catalogs. Um, obviously, in a lot of these use cases that we're referencing, we're dealing with um, enormous volumes of data in the cloud. So. Um, I think it would be interesting to get um, the perspective of the panelists on data catalogs and how, how do we search all this data and all of these resources and, and how do we make sense of it. Uh, Isabel, would you like to, to kick that off? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I deal with big data a lot. You know, all my use cases from our customers are around big data and you know that uh, you know, data volume is, is uh, growing exponential, and the variety of data is also growing, um, you know, at high speed. So, how can a business analyst actually can, you know, find the data for their reports, uh, dashboards, or scorecards, or even analytics? And so, you have new um, technologies um, on the market like data catalogs that can help you locate the right data set to make sure that you're using the right. Um, uh, 
set of data for your analytics, you know, and located among the sea of data. So these tools can automatically crawl, profile, organize, and enrich all your metadata. But they should be doing it, uh, you know, in conjunction with the human as well, because you know, only as I mentioned, for data quality, the line of business people, they know everything about their data. They know why a SKU number is wrong. They know why a customer name uh, in, a, in a particular SKU is wrong. So there is a, a, a need for a mix of technology and the human being to make sure that you are able to sort of curate that data catalog. It's just like in a public library where you have you know, all these uh, technologies helping you locate the books but you also have human beings who can actually enrich this catalog to make sure that you're, you're able to uh, refine the, uh, the data placement and location over time. So now these new data catalog tools also have machine learning embedded, which means that they can really leverage the latest innovation uh, to make sure they can automate all these tasks, the difficult task of locating you know, the volume and variety of data within your organization and even outside of your organization sometimes because you need to interact with the ecosystem. And then you mix that with the human intelligence and that makes it uh, an awesome data catalog to use. Absolutely. Uh, Vincent, do you, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally the data catalog is something that it's, it's, it's important because when you start pulling in all these different data sources, you, you kind of have to know what all the data means. Uh, you know, if you try and figure that out again after the fact, you're going to be in trouble. So the scale of the cloud, the variety of sources that we've talked about, that just means that that big bucket that you're filling is either going to be more valuable or more confusing. And so you want to make it more valuable. And if you want to make it more valuable, something like a data catalog is fundamental and making sure that you understand what the data is, that it's, it's understood what it means, you know, um, what these values are, um, where it's coming from. And then at the analysis endpoint, you're going to have full, you know, visibility into understanding which, which values to slice and dice and which ones mean something, which ones don't. And, and you know, if you see a value, what that, what that metric actually means. You know, is it dollars? Is it in cents? I mean, there, there's so many things that you could label things. And so... Um, yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's a really big, important step to, to really scale. Yeah. You know, as I, as I listen to both the catalog and, uh, and the data quality, I, I know the security and compliance, they always come as a kind of an afterthought, and we'll probably discuss more as we go into the panel. But I think as in both these aspects, it's important that it, uh, security, governance, compliance aspects are covered as you think through the catalog, as you think through the quality. You don't want to have your passwords in clean text. You don't want any PII data. You don't want any of that stuff uh, exposed to the wrong people as you think through the cataloging or you think through the quality. And, and, and if it's easier to design in as you're designing the catalogs and you're designing or solving the quality problems. To Vincent's point, if you address things at the source, it's, it's, in certain cases, a lot better. And, and these aspects need to be, you know, we do, it shouldn't slow down your project, but if thought, or, thought through early on, reduces headaches uh, as you go in the future. Absolutely. Um, so, Isabel, you mentioned machine learning a bit um, when you talked about machine learning embedding in data catalogs, but um, I'd like to expand that a bit more and ask the panel, um, how is machine learning changing advanced analytics in the cloud, and how are data scientists getting involved in the process? So I can get started. So historically, you know, machine learning has been handled mostly by those data scientists, those PhD people. And oftentimes they were building these models in their ivory towers, you know, and they were serving probably a C level three person for their, you know, data strategy. And nowadays, since, uh, you know, all the companies are going through digital transformation, everybody is going to need to engage with their customers, uh, partners, suppliers at some point. And they need to be equipped with uh, data and data intelligence. And so um, all these people can benefit now from the modern machine learning technologies because now you can sort of productize machine learning through you know, those platforms, which can help you scale those data models to the entire data lake or data warehouse. You know, and everybody within the organization can actually make 
you know, smart, smarter decisions um, based upon machine learning. And, and nowadays, um, those data scientists can actually collaborate with the IT teams to sort of work together to be able to refine those data models and scale them to um, the rest of the organization. And with the cloud, you actually have this acceleration, this agility where you can shrink down the time to production for those machine learning algorithms. Because you know, if you deploy those machine learning algorithms in a matter of months, it doesn't help you. But if you can deploy them in a matter of minutes or even seconds, it really helps the business. Because those businesses who can go faster, they can win in the market. Yep, absolutely, I agree. Um, Vincent, do you do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I think that that was covered pretty well. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I think. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I, I, yeah, it's nothing I really love. I think as we the, given the topic of conversation, you know, cloud has really democratized machine learning, and and it's no longer as to Isabel's point something for people in the ivory tower. Anybody and everybody can utilize machine learning technologies to their benefit with the, with the use of cloud. You don't need to do invest tons of tons of time in terms of building boxes and configuring things. It just you have machine learning at your fingertips. The key thing with machine learning is again getting the data to build your models. You know, define before when you get to the data, you think about the kind of business use cases you want to solve. In the case of security and compliance, I know there's a ton of work happening which could not have been possible before because of the democratization of, uh, of machine learning possible cloud. So we could, given the amount of data we need to sort through, given the amount of stuff, it's a, we are able to gather information from a lot of different sources, create models, apply models to identify security and compliance Issues uh, with machine learning. So it's I really it's all it's it's been mind-boggling to see all the advances that have been happening in this area and the benefits it could offer uh, for us in the future. It's still in the early days of us being able to capitalize and achieve all those benefits, but uh, very excited about the potential it has. Mm -hmm. uh, the other advantage of the cloud, I, I would add, is um, the, the, the possibility with all the serverless processing because in the past, when data scientists wanted to work with technologies such, such as Spark, for example, they had to pay for those idle servers. You know, even though they were not running those models, they, uh, the organization had to still pay for those idle servers. And now with serverless technologies, with those data scientists, they can just run their data models and just pay for what they use. And uh, this is really helping some of the companies to shrink down the cost of data processing by up to 80%. So think about this. A lot of the companies, uh, they, uh, they spend 80% of their IT budget uh, keeping the lights on. What if they could flip that you know, coin and spend more on innovation versus just keeping the lights on? That could be a huge uh, game changer for a lot of the organizations out there. Yeah, absolutely. No, those are some great... Um great statistics and points. Um, so I, I do want to transition um, the conversation to talk a little bit more about uh, data governance and privacy in the cloud. But before we do that, um, I, I just wanted to touch on the idea of data gravity and um, how it's changed with the cloud, um, how it's evolved. Um, Isabel, do you have any insight on that? Mm -hmm. So, um, so Vincent mentioned, you know, the, the the numerous data sources at the very beginning and the SaaS application. So we're seeing more and more of the data moving to the cloud. And in the past, you know, when I worked, you know, uh, in these uh, analytics companies, uh, we were actually uh, business analysts were bringing the data to their desktop. We were talking about desktop, OLAV and such. Uh, we would bring the data on, on the laptops to process them for analytics. But nowadays, we're seeing more and more the processing and the tools actually moving to the cloud. They're becoming cloud native. So instead of you know moving the data, we're just going to the data. So the gravity has sort of shifted with the cloud, and uh, we're seeing more and more tools generating you know those native codes, which can be processed directly in the cloud for better performance and most uh, and, and more efficient costing when you're doing the processing. You know, I uh, working at a storage company NetApp, you know, we used to use a statement, you know, you date the compute but you marry the data because you have data has gravity 
And still, if you have massive amount of data, the fastest way to ship the data is with FedEx. So in, in, in BI analytics, sometimes when dealing with the massive quantity of data, it's, you, you, take, uh, you, 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 need, you may need to certain cases move the uh, compute closer to the data. But what's happened in the last five years is the use of cloud has grown dramatically. As a result, no, the data gravity is no longer on-prem. The data gravity, in some cases, is on the cloud. So, uh, and, and it's, it, it, other statistic I had uh, heard was, the number, if you look at the number of boxes that get shipped every year, there are more boxes getting shipped to the cloud than for on-prem. So it's, the data gravity is something that needs to be considered as you look at the analytics but uh, the data gravity is shifting a lot more, more and more towards cloud as we're going in the future. So something to think through as you again plan your BI analytics project. Yeah, I mean, I agree definitely the center of gravity is moving towards the cloud. And I think one of the things that, that um, was mentioned that I completely agree with is the whole um, segregation of compute and storage. I mean, fundamentally, cloud is also changing the way we pay for things. So. You, you, it's kind of become a very lean environment where you really pay for what you want and no more, right? So there's no excess fat. And so in the old world, you know, everything was kind of bundled together, you know, like it or not, just because, you know, the way hardware was configured or shipped or how it got to you. Um, but nowadays, since we're segregating everything and compute and storage can be broken apart, um, it, it definitely makes a difference in terms of how we consume and how we process, right? And so I think fundamentally what that means is you can have a ton of data that's stored and just pay for the amount of storage you have. And then depending on your analytics needs, you know, when it comes time to slice and dice the data, uh, you know, you can kind of ramp up when you need to and make sure you've got the horsepower to chug that data and really kind of, you know, create your models and refine them. And then when you're done and you've got these, you know, models that are perfected, you know, you can you can ramp down, right? And, and now you don't have to pay for all that excess usage. So that's a pretty cool side effect of, of, of moving to the cloud and, and how it, you know, influences all these things. Absolutely. Um, great, great insight on that. Um, so just touching, moving now towards the, the more of the data governance uh, and security angle. Brijesh, um, you touched on this briefly when you talked about preventing personal data from exposure in data catalogs, but uh, can you provide us with a bit more insight on how data governance and compliance factor into the equation when it comes to specifically BI and analytics in the cloud? Uh, absolutely. I think if you see uh, at a broader, uh, the macro scale, we see every year you know, the number of attacks keep going up. The, there's been more and more attacks every year, more and more sophisticated attacks every year, and it's it's security and compliance and data governance is top of mind uh, and in the minds of CEOs, it's no longer just a CIO problem, it's a CEO problem. And while there have been amazing adv advancements that could help speed up solving a problem, at the same time, they need to be solved in a way that you do not compromise on on the compliance, security, data governance. You don't want to lose any PII data. You don't want to lose any credit card data. You don't want to lose or expose business secrets. You don't want to expose any financial data. So it's an important element of any, any aspect of business. Uh, and there have been, I think, a uh, lot of, there are a lot of uh, security compliance controls that have been worked on uh, by, by industry veterans, including you know, our, our company, to help and assist uh, companies with uh, ensuring uh, the security, compliance, and governance of their environment. So it's, I will you know, I'll let uh, Vincent and Isabel chime more, and I'll dig more into what it involves in, in, uh, in solving those problems. But I'd like to get some more thoughts from Vincent and Isabel, and then maybe dig one more level deeper uh, if we have time. Um, so I have some, some good, one a good example of the, uh, the company that um, presented a use case. You know, they implemented a, a government Italy because a lot of the companies today, they have to comply with this regulation. And the most, one of the most recent one was the one in Europe, GDPR. And so if you don't comply with this new regulation, 
these companies have to pay an enormous fine. And so when you think about data compliance, it all starts with metadata. It's data about data, and it allows you to do this full data lineage, where your data is coming from, how it's been transformed, and who is using them. So when you have things popping up like GDPR, when a customer has the right to ask you about all the information you have stored about them, and asking you to sort of remove all the records about them, if you have proper data lineage and proper data governance, you can do it in a matter of you know, uh, hours instead of days and months. So uh, data lineage and metadata um, for your entire you know, uh, data supply chain is very, very important in those days of regulation and compliance. Yeah, um, I, I think that that's absolutely correct. You know, security, you can look at it on, on a number of different tiers, right? I mean, there's fundamentally, there's, you know, securing, you know, the transport of the data, securing the storage of the data, things of that nature. But then when it comes to things like use of the data, like under GDPR and, and, and you know, sensitive data, you kind of have to identify what the sensitive data is, right? You don't just say, gosh, mm -hmm. I'm going to check my sensitive data today. So who would know what that is, right? You're making certain assumptions. Yeah. So... Um, being able to qualify and identify, you know, if you have a governed environment, uh, you'll know. You'll know that, you know, we've determined as a company, you know, we, we've met, we, we've, the stakeholders are, 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 you know, place their flags in the ground, and we're saying, you know what, X, Y, and Z, these are all sensitive, period, and only, you know, these people can see it. And so if you know that up front, then it makes your life a lot easier, you know, whether you're doing, you know, integration up front or governing it or, you know, exposing it at the back end for analytics, you know you're not going to run the risk of, gosh, I've put all this data together and now I've actually created more risk for myself because I don't know if I put too much data in there and now the analyst is going to pull up data that they really shouldn't be seeing, right? And that's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot there. So um, just, you know, if you, if you pay attention to these best practices, and again, these are things that are equally true, to be honest, on premise, but since we're talking about the cloud and kind of the way the cloud scales and how quickly it is, you can shoot yourself in the foot much faster in the cloud, I guess, is what I'm saying, right? And so um, you really do want to still pay attention to these common best practices for data, period, and for security, period, and just move on from that. And so, uh, yeah, just bear in mind these things. They don't change because we're moving to the cloud, but cloud takes away a lot of the stuff. Cloud makes it easier to, to tackle all these things, but don't ignore them. They'll still shoot you in the, you know, you can still shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, so yeah another... like, uh, people... Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so I have another segment to start. Go ahead. I was going to take that as one level deeper, but keep, keep, keep going. I'll, I'll come back. Yes, I just had this uh, one starting start about you know, more than 32% of employees in organization, they have access to data they should not. So this is really right. problematic because you know, um, we need to secure and sort of mask the data for those data scientists who are not supposed to see the security numbers or the patient diseases, you know, uh, diseases when you have you know, doctors asking for data models. So you need to make sure that you can secure the data, mask those sensitive information, especially in the cloud where we're seeing data breaches happening. Yeah, no, no absolutely. I think that people, process, and technology aspects of, of, of this is, is another thing. There's people aspect of who, who, again, you need to define proper processes within the organization, uh, uh, you know, what people can access what, what people are, have, uh, are located where. So there's people, process, you know, the, the process and the data governance process needs to be defined. And then there are technology aspects. And, the good thing is there's a lot of technology available once you have people and process in place or technology to help you guide putting together the right people and process in place for security, compliance, governance. In this area, for example, there have been a lot of standards bodies who have defined uh, uh, the compliance standards. And the good thing is, you know, the security and compliance, they go hand in hand. What, you know, there's... Uh, CIS standards, HIPAA, NIST, PCI, SOC, uh, you know, GDPR, there's a lot of these standards. We have companies like ours, we have taken those standards and, and provided the technical controls for these standards so that you could run uh, and, and get uh, uh, an idea on where do you stand with regards to the security and compliance aspects of, of, uh, of your environment. In our case, we also give a a score, because the other thing is you find as you look, dig deeper into this, 
you'll find tons and tons of issues. You forget 10,000 issues, it's as good as knowing nothing about it because you can't act on those 10,000 items. So there's, again, we, in the security, it's really very interesting because we utilize the BI analytics to identify among the tons of items that may exist, what are the most prioritized impactful items that will have a material impact on improving your security and compliance and governance posture. So, uh, you know, with, there, there are two things available that would help you with this process. It's uh, just that something that needs to be considered and it's increasingly <laughs> important to be considered you undertake your BI analytics project. Great. Um, so, Brajesh, um, I know Vincent mentioned there's there's a few pitfalls that you can encounter with data security in the cloud, and it's easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, but what's your perspective on are there any specific advantages to the cloud from a governance and security perspective when it comes to conducting analytics? No, absolutely. I think uh, if you see, if you look at a bigger broad picture of looking at security compliance, you have, if you draw a boundary around your enterprise perimeter, and you have actors who are sitting outside your enterprise parameters. There may be some actors who may have gotten within your enterprise parameter. And then you have your critical assets that you are protecting. These are the data aspects and, and, and those things. So as you look at that scenario, that boundary, the enterprise boundary is getting broadened and more blurry as you look at both cloud and, and, and on-prem. So it's yeah, yeah, and if you look at the traditional tools and technologies, they're no longer they're no longer adequate in terms of addressing your security and compliance problems. Uh, the good thing with uh, with cloud is things are all known, standard. The variations are at least there, there are a lot of providers providing various things, but things are the num the the cloud vendors are handful. You know, you have three big cloud providers, additional ones. Uh, which are trying to uh, make their way, AWS, Google, Azure, maybe Oracle wants to be seen and IBM wants to be seen, but the number is limited. On on-prem side, you have lots and lots and lots of vendors. So the problem is a lot more bounded uh, on the cloud front because you're dealing with smaller set of stuff and the, the more standards that are getting defined that would at least help you with addressing the, peop the technology aspect of the problem. So I feel, and then plus, uh, you can you can trust the cloud providers themselves that they are putting in significant resources and ensuring their stuff is is uh, also uh, done in a secure and compliant manner. So it's, it has a lot more advantages and benefits. I feel that uh, the the pro the in certain cases the cloud is a lot more secure than on prem. Uh, given given uh, the nature of threats that we are facing, but there the people process aspect which is which is important. You could put all the shield, but if you have broken people and processes, that shield is of no use. Uh, so it's the problem gets simpler with the cloud I see of, but it's a big problem. It's a problem that needs to be thought through and addressed head on uh, uh, in in the world today. Great, good points. Um, so as we're, we reach the 50 minute mark in the conversation, uh, I just wanted to leave a couple minutes at the end for any audience questions, and, and we do have uh, two that came in throughout the presentation. Um, so maybe we can just uh, provide an end cap to the discussion today by chatting a bit about what lies ahead for uh, the cloud and BI. Uh, so that brings me to the following questions on the screen right here. Um, what does the future hold for BI strategy in the cloud, and have we reached the pinnacle, or is this just the beginning? Vincent, if you'd like to start us off on this one. Sure. Um, so we are definitely not at the um, the end of the cycle for cloud. We're we're still in the you know middle slash you know kind of entering the maturity of it. Um, to be frank, I, I think that as much as we talk about it being a, a game changer, the proof is in the pudding. And I, I think that, you know, every organization, especially those that are on the phone or, or you know, watching this webinar, can evaluate for themselves. Odds are they're doing something with the cloud already. So this is something that's, 
ramping up. I think the maturity is going to continue to grow, which means that the market is going to continue to push there. Um, it's not going to be unheard of for, you know, many companies to be cloud only at a certain point in their lifespan. So um, this is this is this is very much a game changer. And so what does it hold for BI strategy in the cloud? I think it pretty much means that a couple of things. I think one is that if you're not in the cloud and your competition is, then you may be, um, you, you, you'll be at a disadvantage in the sense that you won't be able to leverage all the benefits we talked about earlier about cloud, right? So we're talking about the, the economics of it, the performance of it, the agility. You know, you can start and stop anytime you want. A whole group can onboard and, and start a project and load a data warehouse in, you know, hours, right? And if you're still in the old model and you have to call your vendor to ship things to you and install things to you, you'll, you'll never be competitive in that market. So I think by necessity, a lot of companies are going to move to the cloud. Um, and I think from a strategy perspective, that means as, as more and more stuff moves to the cloud, I think it will be more common for um, companies to uh, certainly, uh, you know, do a lot of their analytics in the cloud. Um, I, I think a lot of the tool sets are moving to be, uh, you know, cloud only. Um, you know, I can tell you our company is a cloud first company. We didn't start off that way, but we are now. And, and it's, it's very much a reflection of the market. Um, and, you know, in terms of have we reached the pinnacle or is this just the beginning? Um, this is a big shift. I think it's going to be a long-lasting shift. Um, but, you know, will there be another thing down the pike? Of course. But I, I think for the foreseeable near-term future, uh, you know, we are all moving to the cloud, no matter what industry you're in. Some industries are a little faster than others, but, but we're, we're all going there. And so uh, maybe in the future when we have a webinar like this again, Aaron, um, it won't be a qualifier about, you know, cloud. It'll just be about analytics, and the assumption is that you're in the cloud, right? So, so we're getting there. We're not there yet. And so I think everybody that's listening, you know, definitely pay attention. Take a look to see, you know, what your data assets are, how you want to apply your analytics. Take a look at your tool sets. Um, take a look at your infrastructure, how you're using data. And, you know, find really innovative ways to leverage this transition. I think there's so much you can do. Absolutely. Completely agree. Um, Isabel, do you have anything to add to that? So, so coming from you know 20 years of uh, BI and analytics, I, I must say that uh, there were a, a lot of changes happening in the market. And, and now when you're talking about data lakes or data warehouses, it's no longer a physical thing. I've seen customers implementing logical structures where they have a mix of uh, data lake or data warehouses, both on-prem and in the cloud, because they're moving little and uh, uh, a little more of the data in the cloud. And you would also do have customers having uh, multi-cloud approaches where they want to leverage the best services out there because in the cloud, you just can shop, you know, for the best machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing service and, and then make, make use of the best technologies that is available to your business. So you need to make sure that when, that when you're designing your cloud strategy that you open for these new uh, hybrid type of uh, logical structures and also the ability to sort of leverage all these services that are existing in various clouds, not just in for one single cloud um, uh, infrastructure. Mm, absolutely. Um, so I'll transition now to the questions from the audience, and they're actually both security related. So um, Rajesh, we would really appreciate your insight on, on these. But the first one is, um, how do we prevent attacks on sensitive and personal data? Yeah, that's, you know, that's the way. You, you see it every year. number of those keeps going up. I think the way I, I see it is the people process technology. The vendors like us, we help you with the technology aspect of, of uh, preventing or putting, helping you put shield so that you can prevent these attacks. So we ourselves and many other vendors along with us, we have authored a bunch of security and compliance benchmarks. So we have serious benchmarks for now all three clouds, AWS, Azure, Google. They, these define the security best practices to help you in, in putting a shield so that these technologies are configured in a way to prevent uh, attack, prevent or to put a shield on you can you can reduce the risk, but it's it's uh, best practices to ensure you you that that you know the data can be stolen. There are also uh, uh, the number of benchmarks you know that uh, like yes, as I was mentioning earlier, SOC, HIPAA, GDPR, PCI. So we have taken all those uh, benchmarks 
and then defined the controls to uh, the, the the technical controls that would help you in with achieving those uh, benchmarks. So that's the you know make sure you follow these things. So you make sure you 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 uh, run run your uh, uh, the technology or environment through uh, all these benchmarks to make sure things are that things are protected. That would help you the give you the first level of insight into where you stand with regards to your security and compliance. In our case, we take that a level deeper because you get so many items that you need to address. It's very very important not only to know what needs uh, what is open, what needs to happen, but a prioritized list. Because if you were to look at addressing all those ten thousand. Uh, items that have been found, they won't, that won't happen. So you have to really get a prioritized view of what would have the most impact in regards to uh, in improving your security and compliance posture. So make sure that you, you do those things and, and keep your things uh, 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 secure. But that, that's all a shield, right? It's a shield to help you in reducing it. it there's no guarantee that the, unless the people and process aspects are addressed, there's always a risk. Absolutely. Very true. There is always, always that risk. So um, that kind of brings us to the last question, um, which is what are some data security best practices for the cloud? And maybe we can have um, everybody weigh in on this one, uh, starting with uh, Isabel. So some of the, the things that we've seen from, from our customers is that they've applied this uh, data governance, you know, uh, across the board for their data supply chain, and they also are using data masking to make sure they're uh, hiding those sensitive information from the ones who should not be accessing those information. As I mentioned, 70 percent of the people are accessing, you know, data they should not, um, and uh, so this is pretty uh, pretty dangerous. Uh, because you're exposing to yourself to a lot of liability. And one of the, the things that is really preventing you know, uh, organizations to unleash their data or big data is actually uh, the, this exposure to uh, sensitive information. So, so IT doesn't want to you know, liberate or unlock the data to the business because they're afraid that the data could be misusing the data. So having proper data governance and proper data masking will actually help those organizations unlock um, the, 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 they are, you know, a treasure um, uh, that is lying into the, the data or big data. Great. Um, Vincent, do you have anything to add? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is a, this is pretty, this is a, a pretty loaded question, actually, just because when we say, we start talking about security, it, it, it's not just a one-size-fits-all answer, but um, just off the top of my head, I'd say, First of all, um, security is a big deal, so pay attention to it. Um, definitely, it's not an afterthought. It's not one of those things you think about later. It's one of those things about things you think about up front. And so that's the same way you should treat data, how do you categorize it, where it comes from, who can see it. Um, all those things matter, and you should think about them, again, up front, because once you kind of let it slip and, and kind of let it go after, and now you have to chase it down, it, it's kind of like sending an email and figuring out that you shouldn't have sent it. it. It's really hard to fix things after the fact, right? So once it's in the wild, it's, it's a pain. So, so be, be frank, be upfront, think about security, think about integration upfront when you plan all this. Um, and if you do it upfront, it's going to actually um, do a lot of things for you, right? I think, um, you know, part and parcel with, with taking inventory of security is taking inventory of the data. And you'd be surprised how few people know what their data looks like, you know, in general. Um, if you ask any sort of given person or, or entity, you know, what their data looks like, how many sensitive fields they have, or, you know, uh, where their customer data comes from, like how many sources, it, it, people usually have to scratch their heads quite some time to figure an answer, and they probably have to ask five more people. And, and, and by getting in front of all those things at once, um, your life will be much easier. And that means all the stuff that we talked about about you know, everything that we talked about, about being able to do all those great things in the cloud, they'll, they won't be a risk, they'll be a reward, right, for doing it. So just make sure you, you take care of that up front and, um, you know, and, and all these different platforms and products you use, just from a security perspective, they have security features, learn them, turn them on. Uh, they don't protect you from yourself, but if you use them wisely, they'll help you a lot. Right, right, definitely. It's all about being proactive. So, uh, Brajesh, any final quick thoughts on best practices for data security in the cloud? 
You know, I, I totally agree with both uh, Isabel and Vincent. I think excellent points there. They talk about you know, many of the, the data-related best practices, the process element that you need to address. If you look at, you know, I think as I was mentioning all these benchmarks, if you look at the various benchmarks, they document a lot of these best practices. These, they, they, if you look at different categories, they talk about the identity and access management, how do you set up your passwords, the access to various operating systems, and, and a lot of those things logging and auditing related uh, best practices, monitoring best practices, networking best practices, administrative services, all the stuff. I think all these benchmarks that talk about in detail a lot of these uh, security best practices. And, this, and the number is not small. It's a large number. In our case, we have about 80,000 policies across different operating systems, about 1,000 plus policies across various cloud providers that we provide in our product. Uh, it's just a lot of them. It's, uh, you got to, you know, uh, you know, follow these. Maybe just use some of these tools to first understand where you are. But there are, there's a lot of information available on what are these best practices to follow to secure uh, your environment. Great, excellent. So. Um, with that, we are just about out of time. So I want to thank all of you in the audience for tuning into the panel today. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed uh, today's discussion. And of course, a big thank you to all of our wonderful panelists, Isabel, Brajesh, Vincent, uh, for joining me today and sharing your expertise with everyone here. Uh, it was a real pleasure chatting with all of you. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You, Great. Uh, well, have a great rest of your day, everyone, and uh, please be sure to rate the pre presentation if you haven't already. Thank you so much. Thanks.